Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm here today with Philip Morgan, who is the author of the Positioning Manual for Indie Consultants. And he also runs a the Expertise Incubator for Independent Consultants. It's a program we'll talk about that uh, helps you build your thought leadership program. Uh, Philip, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So why don't we actually just start with the Expertise Incubator, a service that you provide for independent consultants. Uh, describe for us this program that you run. Sure. It's um, it's a small group cohort-based program, and almost everything you learn in this program is from your own experience doing two things that sound really simple, but they're pretty challenging. So as a group, we spend nine months together. First three months, we spend uh, publishing something on the internet every day you work. We, we meaning you, people who participate in it, uh, you sort of voluntarily accept this challenge of publishing something every day. And it sounds simple. It sounds like it will annoy everybody who's on the receiving end of it. And uh, one of those things is true. It is simple, but it's also transformative. Um, it's transformative because you, when you're publishing that much, you feel this implicit obligation to publish something valuable as you're publishing to an email list. And that forces you to pretty quickly churn through everything you have to say that's superficial that anyone else could say. And then once you flush that out of your system, then you, the real work begins of publishing something that's unique thinking that comes from you that only you could possibly put into the world. So it's a simple kind of mechanical practice that gets you to the good stuff in your thinking. The, the second part of the program, which is the last six months of it, we focus on what I call small scale research, which is it's business research. It's meant to address some uncertainty that your market has. And the, the things that come out of this program are things like a clear point of view original research, and those are some of the foundational ingredients of thought leadership. So an easy way to think of it is it's a program that helps independent consultants bootstrap their own ability to do thought leadership. Okay. Can you give me some examples of the type of small-scale research that people have done? Yes, I can. So there's there's a range from um, – well, let me interrupt myself, Will, and say that most of us in our travels across the internet come across this kind of product like you know a company like mailchimp every year will trial you know trawl through their database and produce some kind of interesting report about what they've seen like what's the best time to send an email to get the highest open rate that's a, a simple example state of the industry reports are also pretty common you know, what are the your peer companies doing? Um, what sort of marketing are they using that's working? That sort of thing. So it can range from that all the way to attempting to answer a specific question that your market cannot answer. So, uh, Will, can, can I put you in the hot seat for a minute? Sure. And, and I will get to those examples. <laughs> um, but I just want to make sure folks understand what small scale research is. So, uh, like what's a question that, um, that you or your clients face in their business that there's no, like one single answer to first thing that comes to your mind. Well, uh, question a lot of, uh, our clients have is, you know, how do I find an independent consultant for, you know, who has the following skill set, right? And, okay. uh, and what, you know, and what's the typical rates for those people? How do I find them? Uh, and I mean, that's what Umbrex does, right? That's the service that we offer. So that's a question that okay. our clients have that we answer. Right. So sometimes those sorts of questions need like a customized, unique to you answer. And sometimes they can be answered, maybe not completely and thoroughly, but 
at least partially answered in a way that speaks to the entire to everyone who has that question um a variation of that would be uh like what's how effective is uh, how many clients have found a, an independent consultant through social media versus some other channel and if you're the independent consultant who's considering using social media that would be a relevant piece of research for you and so it can be as simple as surveying people or conducting a number of uh, interviews to gather data and then package that in a way that's useful to the folks that you're you're trying to serve or reach i think of um, a guy named tom miller and the research he did uh, at the time his business was focused on email marketing for consultants uh, that was like the name of the business email for consultants or maybe it was email for experts. Anyway, <laughs> Tom was curious, how do uh, consultancies generate leads? What works, what doesn't? So he surveyed uh, maybe a little over 100 um, folks in this market and did a bunch of interviews additionally. And that was enough data for him to start to see some patterns where based on how the company is, is specialized or not specialized, certain types of lead generation work better or worse depending on the, the way the company is set up and what their you know what their market focus is etc so that's a nice example of the kind of research that i'm talking about okay can you give just three or four other examples of kind of projects or research efforts that uh, people in the program have done yeah i can um so a guy named kyle bowen his focus is on the museum industry. He's a consultant for um, museums and cultural institutions. His was more, his research work was more like a state of the industry survey. So, you know, what issues are people concerned about in the museum and cultural industry? Um, I'm not uh, recalling exactly what else, but I, we've all seen enough of those state of the industry surveys to, I think, have a mental picture of what that looks like. That's, again, based on a relatively small number of uh, surveys and interviews. Um, there's a guy named Stephen Quinsley who was, uh, Stephen's a software developer and particularly focused in the world of uh, cloud security. He was interested in the question, um, how do uh, people who are using cloud services think about the level of security that their application has? And is there some way to, um, it, it, was there any kind of relationship between their perception of the level of security and the actual level of security? And I realize I'm not doing a great job of explaining this because <laughs> this is Stephen's expertise, not mine. But where it led him was to to realize there was an underserved need in the market and he's building a software a uh, piece of software called k9 letter k the number nine security so that was the outcome from from his research not uh, a report or a publication or a white paper or anything like that it was an idea for a software product so it's, those are a few more examples so it sounds like an important part of your program is uh, not merely kind of navel gazing and reflecting and sharing your own personal experience, but you're really encouraging people to go out to the market and whether it's a survey or a set of interviews or some other way of engaging the market, it's actually doing some primary research to generate some unique insights. That's correct. I, um, I think it's, it's kind of a shame that a lot of us hear the word research and we think, big, large-scale research with a lot of rigor and a lot of sort of statistical uh, controls necessary to pull it off and a lot of money and time necessary, I think that there's a really valuable layer underneath that in terms of size where really ordinary people can just have a sort of empathetic desire to make things better for their market and do a little bit of research and actually can make things better. So that's that's really where this all springs from, is this belief that ordinary people can generate real 
valuable insight by mm-hmm. using some simple tools. Walk me through, through some of the specifics of that or an example. So what does that look like in practice? Someone does 10 interviews or uh, just walk me through how someone has actually done one of these research projects. So you want to start with a, a question that is not going to overwhelm your ability to to execute on it. So um, that's the first thing. It's just kind of a, a, a pretty small scope question. And I really push people to go smaller, not bigger <laughs> with these questions because um, you can always go bigger later or you can always use the momentum of a small success to build to something bigger. So it starts with a question. You will do a brief literature review, which is a fancy word for Googling. <laughs> and uh, you, you know, searching using a few specialized uh, sites that search academic research papers, because what you want to do is make sure you're not duplicating someone else's effort. Um, because if you, if you, if that's the case, if someone's already answered this question in a good way, that saves you the time and effort, and you can just move on to something different or build on what they've already done. The method tends to be either about, I'm going to name a number, and I do so with some hesitation because I wouldn't want people to anchor too much to that, but around 30 interviews will, in a, for the right size question, will often clarify things tremendously and produce this uh, diminishing return of, of information. So the 31st interview doesn't teach you nearly as much as the first or fifth or 10th interview. But I, I want to give that number so that folks realize this is a doable thing. This is not hard to spend 30 hours talking to people. There's other time. But um, that's one way to think of it. And another way to think of it is, is sending a survey to a few hundred people or maybe 500 or 1,000 people and getting you know, 75 or 100 responses. For other kinds of questions, that can be the method that gives you the, the insight that you're missing. And then it's you know, spending some time with the data, soaking in it, and looking for patterns and looking for something that you can articulate as, I'm going to say an answer, but it could just be a way of reducing the market's uncertainty about the question. All right, great. Let's turn to your book. Yeah, so let's turn to your book, The Positioning Manual for Indie Consultants. Um, Let's start, let's just jump to chapter two, The Platformer Advantage. Tell me about what is The Platformer Advantage. So, um... You picked my favorite chapter, Will. (laughs) Um, Platforms are things that lots of businesses use and they need help implementing them. Those things can be business process frameworks like entrepreneurial operating system, lean, agile, test-driven development. There's uh, there's a lot of those kind of business process frameworks, um, story brand, is an example of that. There are these sort of recognized ideas. Businesses hear about them and say, that sounds good. Let's do that. And then they, then they not always, but often need help from outside consultants. Uh, platforms can be software like AWS, Windows, Linux. Those are software platforms. Salesforce would be a good example there. And they can be um, software tools like programming languages or frameworks. So that's what a platform is. And the easiest way to specialize is to specialize in a platform. You get this advantage if it's early on. um, I'm going to, again, be specific in a way that sometimes I'll be wrong, but most platforms have reached maturity in five to seven years. So if some new platform comes on the market, starts gaining popularity, in about five to seven years, it will be a mature product. For the first half of that time period, the platform owner is really busy just building and growing the platform. So if you show up 
as an independent consultant or any kind of you know independent person and you're excited about the platform you see this a lot in software and then you start publishing contributing best practices creating training products that you might sell yourself the platform owner is busy they need your contributions for the platform to be considered a complete product they will support your efforts to make the platform better they they will um, sort of amplify and give you visibility and opportunities because you're in there in there early helping them build the platform not in a formal sense where you're working for them but in an informal sense you're part of that ecosystem once they start seeing growth start to level off which it inevitably will they switch modes to being um, less giving. <laughs> and what they want to do is, uh, this is a thing that happens over and over again. They want to turn your business into a commodity because the more standardized and um, sort of high quality and consistent the vendors in the ecosystem are, the better it is for their platform. And the more uh, vendors kind of standardize on rates that are economical and affordable to a wide range of clients, the better it is for the platform owner. So when they see growth start to level off, they will stop being quite so giving and they'll start sometimes competing with you. Like they'll maybe set up their own services division to find new ways to generate revenue. So platforms are really in the early days an incredible boost if you're specializing and in the later days they're kind of a threat because they force your business to become more efficient and if you started with the platform in the early days you're not used to having to, to operate in such an efficient manner you're used to being more of an innovation business where a lot of your value comes from figuring things out in the later days of the platform your value comes from consistent, high quality, lean, efficient execution. Okay. So, so it's I, a tr it's a tough transition. Yeah. Sorry, so go ahead, Will. Okay. So I can the way I'm interpreting this is by platform you're talking about something like SAP. So you might say, yep. okay, I'm going to hitch my wagon to that you know, horse and say I'll be an SAP focused consultant. I help implement SAP. So I kind of get I kind of get that, and then SAP, you know, will help maybe um, promote you or amplify you, invite you to conferences. Maybe you're a speaker or something uh, in the early days. Uh, beyond the software platforms, I'm not sure how the metaphor holds for something like if you're a change management consultant or strategy consultant or lean operations consultant or supply chain consultant, where it's not so much dominated by some you know software company uh how, how does that metaphor carry over to those areas well it may or may not um the, the best examples are anything where there's a new york times best-selling book that says here's how you do any of those things you just mentioned i can't i don't have any examples in mind for here's how you do you know supply chain management yeah, we okay, have well, a well, uh, blue, blue chain, blue ocean strategy, right? That's a book that came out. Right. Oh, innovation, blue ocean, et cetera. Find some blue space. Yeah, sure. That's a good one. Yeah, but like you could call yourself, well, I'm a blue ocean implementation consultant or something, but kind of, I mean, and you're what suggesting that okay, you take that as your platform and and then you publish a bunch of stuff about how to apply blue ocean to the dog food industry and you become a blue ocean expert in some niche. Right. Yeah. The best example there is on the entrepreneurial operating system. And that's one where, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, the people who own that IP said, yes, you can be an implementer, but you have to operate as a franchise. And that was a, a, a significant change to how they wanted to control and own that IP. Prior to that, I think they were pretty happy for anyone to show up and say, I'm an EOS implementer. So that's the most vivid example I can think of, of the kind of 
transition from like a friendly to a less friendly environment or a unstructured to a more structured environment around the platform. But there are plenty of, of platforms that are more idea based where that may never happen because the people who put it out into the world don't want to exert that kind of control. Mm-hmm. So you're definitely right. I think will that, uh, there are like, I, you know, the blue ocean folks, I struggle to imagine them ever getting to that point where they have that kind of like closed system mentality of, Oh, we need to control and heavily monetize this. My guess is they're just happy to do the consulting they do and let others do what they want with the ideas. But it is a lot of times I'm not always, but a lot of times I'm advising clients from a somewhat risk averse perspective. So I want to make sure they understand that in some cases, this is what happens with a platform, but not in every case, as you point out. Okay. Um, and I, I suppose there's some pros and cons of, you know, using a platform. You know, one is that if you sort of pick one that isn't really taking off, you could, you know, get... Yeah, you pick a loser. <laughs> you, know, you pick pick one that sort of doesn't really take off for the next few years, and you're I'm an expert in this, you know, XYZ software, that, and then nobody's really calling for that. Um, yeah. Or you sort of are relying on someone else's brand and IP, so it's uh, right. easy to have copycats, as opposed to coming up with a platform yourself and saying, no, not the blue ocean strategy, I have the green ocean strategy. It's very different, you know. Um, right. <laughs> so talk to me about the next chapter, then, earning visibility without a platform. How do you, you, know, how do you encourage consultants to build visibility when, if they're not connected up with one of these um, software companies or other ideas? That, I think, depends a lot on their context um, and, and how quickly they want to get results. So you can, um, I, I use the analogy of renting the infrastructure you need for visibility. And with that, it's it's things like speaking at conferences or events. It's, um, you know, getting in front of someone else's audience the way I'm doing right now with your audience. That's that's all kind of borrowing or you know, quote unquote renting someone else's infrastructure. That is almost always going to be faster than building your own. But, you know, once again, you don't own it, you don't control it. And it's not like you really own anybody else's attention or visibility, but there are things like your own email list or your own podcast. These are things that you have more control over and more ability to benefit from in the long term. So if you have more time, the sim- I mean, the simple message of that chapter, Will, is if you have more time, you probably want to build it yourself. And if you have less time, meaning uh, you need results quicker, then you're going to want to rent or borrow someone else's infrastructure all of which is easier if you've decided to specialize because without that, you just don't know where to, where to go to, you know, reach out to someone and say, Hey, can I be on your podcast? Or are you looking for speakers or whatever it is like that, that decision about where to focus gives you a real advantage when it comes to earning visibility. Mm -hmm. And then talk to me about beachheads. You have this chapter, the importance of thinking in terms of beachheads. What's that term mean? Well, a beachhead is a sort of a temporary place where you can focus a lot of force and establish some forward momentum. And this analogy of a beachhead was my attempt in in the book to try to help people realize that um, specializing, building a market position is a process that happens over time. And you might have something in mind for 10, 20 years down the road that's much bigger and completely unachievable on day one. So you might make a decision to specialize in a way that doesn't represent your ultimate goal. And it's also an attempt to try to let folks know that all of this is about momentum. None of this is about like perfection on day one. When you decide to, to specialize your, you're doing something that builds up momentum, but from there, other possibilities reveal themselves and 
you know, as I'm saying this, I'm like, wow, this sounds so obvious, <laughs> but that's, that's what the idea of a beachhead is about. So anytime you specialize, you're just trying to find the place that's going to be easiest or best for you to get started. And then from there you can refine and things will change. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you're always going to be responding to what's happening in the larger world. And it, so that's really the point is nothing's permanent. Um, the way I like to joke about it is you're not getting a face tattoo when you decide to specialize. It's not that permanent. You talk about the five ways of specializing in the book. Walk, walk us through those five different ways of specializing. Yeah, there's two main categories there. There are what are known as vertical specializations. And so with those, you can choose a market vertical otherwise known as an industry or a sector, manufacturing, finance, higher education. Those are three really different verticals. So that could be how you decide to focus. You could focus on an audience, which is a group of businesses that have something in common, but they're not necessarily in the same industry. So nonprofits are an audience. There are nonprofits in lots of different verticals, but uh, they have something important in common, which is their business model. And sometimes, you know, they kind of see the world in in that non -profit -y, you know, we're here to serve, not make money kind of a way. Those are the vertical specializations. Horizontal specializations are focusing on either some functional area of the business, like you mentioned earlier, supply chain. Uh, that's a great example of a horizontal. Lots of companies have a, a supply chain management function. And so when you specialize horizontally, you're specializing in that skill set or that expertise, and you don't really care what industry your clients are in. The other form of horizontal specialization is focusing on a platform. We've talked about that a fair bit. Um, and then the fifth is this, uh, basically, you can think of it as a productized service where you specialize a service that you offer in a really sort of unique way. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, this company, Worst of All Design, and they do uh, branding, but they deliver it in a particular way um, that's only going to appeal to a really narrow slice of the market. They do these one-day branding sessions or workshops. And so in one day, you can have this full-day experience with them and walk away with the thing you wanted. It's not open-ended. You know how much it's going to cost. You're not worried if it's going to drag on for weeks or months longer than it's supposed to. And so those, the way the service is designed makes it specifically appealing to a really narrow slice of the market. So that's the fifth way is specializing a service. Hmm. Can you share any success stories, examples of consultants that you have known or worked with who, you know, worked on building a, thought leadership visibility and that led to, you know, some good things happening with their business. Let me uh, think down through the list of what, what specific, what kind of specific example could, well, could be most helpful here? An independent consultant who started with not publishing and then they go and went through your program, uh, started publishing every day for 90 days and then they did a research project and, publish something in the state of our industry and that led to all sorts of inbound leads, people finding them online, people reaching out to them. Right. I mean, that's the goal, right? That's the goal of the program, right? Well, actually, sp the goal is not lead. This isn't about lead generation like during the nine months. Um, it is, uh, it's more focused on the sort of inputs or prerequisites to that. Um, let me see here. I can scroll down through a list of folks from the past. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, this guy named Guillaume is my uh, favorite example. Uh, Guillaume's a, a French guy living in Seattle, and his focus is on. Uh, well, it would have started out, he would have described it as uh, like strategic storytelling. So a sort of management consulting focus where the idea is on um, 
you know, we're going to kind of get our story straight within our business so we can have our employees become more aligned and, and more effectively communicate with the market what, what it is we do. He tends to work with uh, not exclusively startups, but it, yeah, that's a little bit more where things are skewed for him. And so writing about that a lot led him to this point where uh, I think he would I think he would say this to anybody. Nobody knows what storytelling means, and there's no evidence that it really works. Um, storytelling as a business tool is what I mean. I know not this is not some broader condemnation of storytelling in general, but just storytelling as as a business tool the way he was applying it. That created this moment where uh, I wouldn't would not, not have wanted to have been in his shoes. I think he was pretty frustrated. And it created this curiosity. Is there something good here and we're not just we're just not doing it right? Or what would work better? And what he arrived at is it there is something valuable there. It needs to be thought about differently. And so he created his uh, sort of invented his own framework for approaching storytelling where he now talks about it as a strategic narrative and talks about it as a system of four kinds of stories that you need to figure out in order to effectively do business storytelling. So that's where he is now. He has a really great framework. And when he emails people and says, hey, I want to tell you about my framework. And when I say emails people, I mean people who are strangers and don't know him. But when he can, you know, tell them, sort of hint at this framework that he has and talk about how storytelling, the way it tends to be practiced, is ineffective and doesn't work, then he gets people on the phone to, to hear him out and hear what this new thing is. Um, and he's in the process of turning that into what's next, which is, you know, a flow of inbound leads. It's fantastic. That's maybe the best. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful, like that's exciting to me because the numbers aren't showing up yet in terms of, well, you know, on this spreadsheet, I can show you the impact of this work, but that's always preceded by conversations where people say, okay, I've never heard this before. Tell me more. So to me, that's a leading indicator of, of good things to come. That's great. Philip, if, uh, listeners wanted to follow up and uh, find you online or reach out, where would you point them? I would point them to an email course that talks about positioning because that's such a foundational thing. I would point them to positioningcrashcourse.com and that would let them kind of dip a toe in further and see what this idea is about and see if it's relevant. That's the one place I would send folks. Um, I'm easily Googleable if if that's not the thing they were looking for, but yeah, positioning crash course is the thing I would suggest next. All right. Well, we will include that link in the show notes. Philip, thank you for joining today. Will, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.